Good day, everyone. I'm Ebony Bennett. I'm Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series, part of Australia Institute TV. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and by acknowledging the traditional owners here, past and present, uh, and acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land and that all of us have a lot of work to do to secure a voice to parliament, treaty and a truth-telling process uh, as the invitation was extended to us by the Uluru Statement from the Heart. As you will know, long-time watchers, the Australia Institute aims to do these webinars at least weekly, but the days and times do vary. So please make sure you head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to find all of our webinars and other events. Coming up, we'll be speaking with Independent Senator for South Australia, Rex Patrick, and activist Chanel Contos about understanding consent. And just a few tips before we begin to help things run smoothly today. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should be able to see a Q&A function where you can ask questions of our panellists and also upvote other people's questions and make comments. Um, please keep things civil in the chat or we'll have to boot you out. We don't do it often, but we will if we need to. And finally, a reminder that this discussion is live and it's being recorded. We'll make a copy available up on our YouTube site at the end of this. So often the policy debate in Australia is so often dominated by what's happening in the United States or in the UK. But the Australia Institute's Nordic Policy Centre looks to the Nordic countries, which are amongst the happiest in the world, uh, amongst other things, for policy inspiration. And that was indeed the inspiration for the new book, The Nordic Edge, Policy Possibilities for Australia, co-edited by Andrew Scott and Rod Campbell. The book examines everything from prison reform to electric vehicle policy, and tonight's special guest Margot Wallström contributed a chapter on Sweden's feminist foreign policy. And to formally introduce the former foreign minister of Sweden, I'd like to hand over to the inaugural convener of the Nordic Policy Centre and co-author, or co-editor and author of the book, Professor Andrew Scott. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Ebony. And um... Welcome everybody and Margot, it's good to see you again on Zoom as we've had a few Zoom chats before over the last 18 months since COVID first struck. Um, welcome and thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your experience as Sweden's Foreign Minister from 2014 to 2019, following on from your earlier work uh, as a Commissioner in the European Union and high level work with the United Nations. Um, I want to start, Margot, by asking you, why did you lead a feminist foreign policy as Swedish foreign minister in those years? First of all, um, uh, good evening to all friends down under. Mm -hmm. And thank you, uh, Andrew. Uh, it has been a, a pleasure and a true honour to contribute to, to this book. And I found it very politically very, very interesting and also impressive in that it sets out all the, the details uh, about in the comparison between Australia and, and the Nordic countries in, in different policy areas. So, so thank you again and, and very nice to, to see you, even though I had preferred to be with you uh, 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 down under. Now, uh, well, of course, uh, the government that I was a member of, the Red-Green government, when we took office, um, it was after eight years with, uh, with uh, parties on, on the right of, of politics. And of course, we wanted to set our own policy uh, direction. And we and I announced that we would pursue a feminist foreign policy um, based on the research that shows that more women in peace processes means more peace. So it was as simple as that. It belonged to foreign policy. Um, and uh, also I came to and, and took office as, as a foreign minister with um, a fresh experience of working on the issue of sexual violence in war and conflict. And uh, that made a deep impression on, on me. And uh, both, uh, I, I often say that it was, um, it gave me um, um, nightmares, but also paradoxically more hope for the future because uh, I met with all of those survivors of sexual violence and, and understood that they don't want to be, be defined only as victims, but they are also 
actors and, and want to be part of shaping their own future and the future of their countries. Thank you. And so the explicit feminist foreign policy, how did that build on earlier Swedish policy? Well, we are fortunate in, in that we've had, I would say, a common understanding of the, the basis and the fundamentals of a foreign policy. Uh, and gender equality has also been on, on the uh, Swedish government's foreign policy uh, before. Uh, but um, uh, until the, the feminist foreign policy, it was mainly concerned with foreign aid and, and rights. And uh, now it became more prominent in areas like uh, security, uh, policy, defense and, and trade. And um, underpinning this was a long, strong, long-standing uh, uh, valuing of gender equality in our domestic policy in, in Sweden. And what we have seen is, of course, that Swedish men have been taken on much more responsibility for, for household labor and parenting during my lifetime um, because of, I would say, mainly social democratic policies. Um, and uh, also that we have, since uh, 1979, we banned physical violence against children, including by, by parents, a very important uh, step as, as well. Um, and I think it has changed the role of, of fathers, of, of men. Um, and uh, of course, uh, parental leave has meant a lot in, in changing the attitude of, of uh, men. But we still have a problem, like I would say most countries around the world, with violence against uh, women. Um, and um, this is something that we really have to work on together uh, and on a global uh, scale. Um, and we've had also a, a number of other uh, reforms that I think have changed also the role of, of men because they will continue to be very important in making sure that, uh, that gender equality becomes a, a reality. Yeah, absolutely. Margot, I was going to ask, I was really interested there about the reaction when you first kind of labelled it as a feminist foreign policy and um, that you kind of had to explain that feminism wasn't all about hating men. <laughs> how did, how no, was it received? Uh, well, we of course knew and I knew that uh, there it comes with a negative connotation in, in many countries and is very often interpreted as being against men. I think, you know, if you choose a controversial term like this, then it gives you also an opportunity to, to use the definition, to set the definition, to explain what it is, and you also create expectations. And that was that's the whole point of, of using something that you know would be uh, partly uh, controversial. So of course we had, you, you can look it up. What is feminism? What does it mean? What does it stand for? And it is as simple as saying that men, men and women should enjoy the same rights and opportunities and obligations in, in the society. Um, but of course it is easy when it comes to implementing that. So it gave us a, an opportunity to explain what feminism is and also why it is connected to foreign policy, why it belongs to foreign policy and security policy, and that more women means more peace, uh, basically. And um, I think that it quickly shifted into um, a debate about, so how do, we, how do we pursue this? How do we implement it also through all our embassies around the world? And that is why I introduced also the parameters that we were going to, to use, namely those three R's. Um, that, that means, you know, rights that we look at, do women and girls enjoy the same legal and, and human rights everywhere? Uh, what about the representation? Are they there around the table where important decisions are being made? And also resources. What about uh, budgetary resources? Uh, are they used to meet also the needs of, of women and girls? And uh, I think that helped a lot. And we added a couple of R's. Uh, also, we said that it starts with a reality check. And this is in the book, you talk also about uh, gender budgeting. 
for example, you have to make sure that you have the, the right statistics uh, to, to um, describe reality in, in, in uh, different countries. And then uh, you also have to, to make sure that you get good results. So that was uh, the, the, the effect of, of all of this in the end. Uh, thanks, Margot. Um, yes, well, you, you mentioned in the book how um, that Australia has slightly higher than the average in terms of women as a proportion of parliaments. Globally, the average is less than a quarter. In Australia, it's 30%. Sweden is close to 50% now. Um, and you, you say more women, more peace. So is there evidence, in fact, that when more women are involved, that peace uh, agreements are achieved and that they last longer? Yeah, um, we uh, we don't have that much of uh, of uh, statistics about this because unfortunately fewer than ten percent out of peace agreements um, have a female signature. And between nineteen ninety and uh, twenty fourteen, out of one hundred thirty peace agreements, women signed only thirteen, and sexual violence is. Uh, uh, is a, a weapon in wars and conflicts all around the world, but very often this is um, uh, something that, that uh, is not mentioned in, in peace agreements and not followed up properly. Uh, uh, and also 104 countries in the world have laws that prevent women from taking on uh, certain uh, jobs, for example. We have we have statistics to show that there is a discrimination against women and that uh, in the cases where women have been part of the peace process, where they have been around the table, where they have signed a peace agreement, you have more options put on, on the table uh, to, to discuss for a peace agreement, like in Colombia, where women introduced uh, land reform as one of the, the most crucial uh, things to put in a peace agreement, uh, but also that it lasts longer because women are peacekeepers uh, sort of in their societies and in their homes and in, in their uh, villages and in their countries. So this is important uh, statistics, uh, uh, although this unfortunately is a, a modern a phenomenon that women are uh, around the table and look at look around the world right now. Do you see women taking part in the peace processes or the discussions in Yemen? Do you see that what is going on in Afghanistan right now, uh, in Syria? I mean, it has been a constant struggle for women to, to be able to participate in the negotiations or the, the agreements that, that will shape their future as, as well. And they make up half of the population. So to me, it is also a matter of democracy. Uh, one other statistic um, which you've told me, I didn't know this before, I don't know how many other people would know this, but what proportion of girls under the age of 18 in the world are married? And why is that proportion such a problem? Well, uh, you might think that, and you might find that this is a, a shocking statistical that uh, every fifth girl uh, in the world under 18 years of age is, is married. Um, we have to look at why this is, because in many countries, and when I traveled, for example, to the Lake Chad, uh, countries around Lake Chad, um, they explained to me that this is a way to um, uh, secure um, the, uh, livelihood for, for, for the girls. You know, if they are married away, then there is a, a husband who will take care of them. Otherwise, girls are discriminated against in, in every aspect, from healthcare to the fact that they have to do household chores and not play, they cannot go to school, they don't have the right to to do all the things that boys normally can, can enjoy. And at the same time, you have to understand that when such a big proportion of, of young girls are married away before they are, they will also give birth to many children. So in both Chad and Niger, Niger I think it was um, uh, the average uh, number of children were uh, six or seven children. 
And of course, they will never get back to school. They don't have a chance to get a proper education. And it will be so much more difficult to fight poverty because they will remain in, in poverty. Uh, so I think that this is something we, we have to uh, help with. We have to make sure that also girls can enjoy um, a proper education and have the, the right and access to, to education. That's where it starts. Um, and I think we have to look at that also with our development uh, policies. We have to go back to some very basic uh, elements like ensuring uh, access to education. Um, Margot, I was going to ask about what it actually looked like uh, when you implemented feminist foreign policy. Uh, I noted in the chapter you talked about making sure that uh, women were invited to give input to uh, security discussions and that female mediators and negotiators were part of uh, agreements and things like that. What did it actually look like when you started implementing it? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we served also uh, during my, my period as, as or my, my mandate as, uh, as um, foreign minister, we served two years as a non-permanent member of the Security Council uh, at the United Nations. And of course, we, we had to make sure that, that we were consistent also in everything we did in the Security Council. And I, I will claim that we put this whole issue of women, peace and security firmly on the Security Council's agenda. We made sure that every product of the Security Council, you know, whether it is uh, um, presidential resolutions uh, or resolutions or statements or, you know, the, the outcome of every meeting of the Security Council, that we have this issue covered, that it is mentioned. We invited as many women as briefers to the um, Security Council as men, and that happened for, for the first time. We made sure that uh, in, in every discussion about the country situation, that this was also, you know, I made my ambassador raise his hand and say, where are the women? So this was the question we repeated. And um, I know that, for example, Germany and other countries now, Norway and those who serve on the Security Council have, have taken on uh, to, to continue that, that work. So, so this was uh, very important. And I have often told the story about, about my ambassador because the Security Council traveled to Mali. And he said, well, you always you know, make me ask that question, where are the women? And when we came to Mali, women came up to me and said, thank you very much for putting language about women's participation in the resolution about uh, Mali, because for the first time we could meet with the president of our country. We, we were actually given a, a, a seat around the table. So I think that, um, that this is uh, important. And then, of course, you have to set up a structure at the national level. We had an ambassador who worked on, on this issue. We uh, introduced training for uh, all our, our diplomatic, the diplomatic corps. We, we made sure that uh, there was a, a structure that would remain even if, if we went out of, of office or voted out of, of office, that, that this would uh, strengthen the way we, we work on these issues through our, our embassies around the world. Margo, can I mention um, one direct contact that Sweden and Australia had in foreign policy was when the young Australian named Alex Sigley went missing almost exactly two years ago in North Korea. And there were grave fears for his safety. And then all of a sudden he emerged, uh, accompanied by a Swedish diplomatic envoy that you personally had sent. And Maurice Payne, our foreign minister and minister for women, expressed gratitude and thanks to you and Sweden for extricating Alex from North Korea. But how did Sweden do that? Why was it Sweden and what does Sweden do differently in foreign policy that might have led to that? <clears throat> well, thank you for, for mentioning this and Sweden's role in, in, uh, in achieving that outcome actually uh, came about in part because we had um, uh, maintained the diplomatic uh, presence and, and representation in North Korea since mid 1970s. And as one of the few countries that have had an embassy there, um, Australia, Canada, and the United States um, 
um, we are um, we serve as uh, as embassies and and try to help also your countries uh, uh, in in North Korea. Um, and then we also invited uh, and received the foreign minister of North Korea to Stockholm in March 2018. Um, we tried to contribute to strengthening the communications and help to de-escalate also the very high tensions between uh, North Korea and the United States at, at that time. But, um, you know, you even though you are very restricted, also our uh, ambassadors and, and our staff at the embassy have been very restricted in exactly what they can do, but they build up uh, a knowledge and contacts in, in the country. And we've also had a special envoy. And, and I think thanks to, to those contacts, we were able to, to help. So I, I was very pleased that, that, we, could, that we could help. Uh, uh, and I hope he's well. I'm sure he was very relieved that Sweden did take that approach to foreign policy, as was his family and many others. Not a transactional approach in foreign policy, but acting according to values and the importance of maintaining dialogue and so on. Um, it hasn't always been an agreement between Sweden and Australia, though. Um, you were European Commissioner for the Environment from 1999 to 2004. How did you go with Australia then in, in tackling climate change? Well, I visited Australia also as a commissioner for the environment and, and in my portfolio was also climate change. So for example, what is being discussed now with the emissions trading system or the chemicals legislation was, was part of my responsibilities. But um, I, I, I went to Australia because I really wanted Australia to come on board. Uh, uh, at that time, it was the Kyoto Protocol um, that we discussed on, on climate change, but it was not easy. And, and uh, Australia chose uh, a different uh, path. Uh, maybe now uh, the debate in Australia uh, has changed also with the experience that you've had of these extreme weather uh, conditions with uh, fires and, uh, and, and drought and, and what have you. Um, and these, um, this will continue. The extreme weather events uh, um, has been pointed out as one of the effects of climate change by all the, the consecutive reports from the IPCC. And uh, we simply have to, to do more um, and we don't have much time. So uh, at the moment, as you know, the European Union is presenting a new package um, with the rather drastic uh, measures. Um, not even that might be enough um, to uh, keep us under the 1.5 degree uh, change in, in, in temperature, but, um, but we, have to, we have to start. And I think the, the minute you put that in place, I, I think other countries will also see that it is possible and they will have to follow and more and more countries will be affected by these extreme. Uh, yeah, um, I'm, I'm really sorry to report that uh, the bushfires sadly didn't seem to change uh, the federal government's policy on climate change much, certainly didn't increase their ambition to reduce emissions. Um, <clears throat> but I was going to ask about that European package that we've just heard about. One of them includes a carbon border adjustment mechanism. So uh, very emissions intensive um, exports from Australia, such as aluminium and things like that, um, could be subjected uh, to, to tariffs. So do you think that's the reality that even if um, domestically the politics are still quite difficult at a federal level for Australia, that more and more international pressure is going to face the country as other countries see the impacts and, and really try and lift their ambitions? Yeah, I, I yeah, I, absolutely. <laughs> That's my short answer. Yes, I think, <laughs> I think we will see that um, um, it, it will accelerate um, drastically, uh, you know, the effects of, of climate change. Can I recommend um, a Netflix movie um, um, called um, The Boundaries? Um, oh my goodness, it's with Johan Rockström, a professor, Swedish professor, and David Attenborough. Breaking, breaking Boundaries, it's called. I think it sets out the 
the the the scene that we um, that we can see for for uh, climate change, and it's done in a very sort of scientific um, way, um, and at the same time easy to understand for for everybody. It doesn't take away all our hopes. Uh, luckily, it says that we still have a, a reasonable chance to to do something about this, but it it does it in a very pedagogical uh, way and. Um, um, I, I just think we need to, to understand exactly what we are uh, about to do. And of course, we are here in the Arctic um, um, region, and you are uh, on the other, you're down under <laughs> you know, in the Antarctica. <laughs> and we will be the most affected. You know, it's like you and Oxum said that if, if the snow melts, the snow and ice melts on, in the Arctic region, it's like when the sun is shining and you take off your cap from your head, you know, and the sun will shine directly on you. So we see that the increase in temperature is going much, much faster. And I know that Antarctica is also affected in, in the same way that uh, it will be very dramatic unless we do something. Quickly. Yeah, there's um we'll get to questions from the audience um just shortly, but uh I thank you for that Netflix recommendation. We've actually got two cities uh in Australia who are in lockdown due to COVID, so I'm sure they'll all be looking for Netflix mm -hmm. recommendations yeah. at the moment. Breaking, well, breaking, breaking well. boundaries. Um yeah, Andrew, please. did you have um another question before we go to the QA? Uh I would like to ask you um about asylum seekers. Um Sweden and Germany are the two countries in Europe which have gone against the tide and taken many asylum seekers in recent years. And it, it, it does contradict the, the, the incorrect image that many have of Sweden as being a monocultural place where only blonde people are. I mean, there's three blondes in this panel, but- um, you know, Mine's fake. <laughs> uh, that's not typical of Australia or, or really Sweden mm. anymore. Um, why has Sweden, like Germany under Angela Merkel, taken so many asylum seekers, and do you think Australia should take more? I think we have to share the responsibility, and the, I, um, it's not only a burden, but it, it can be also at times a burden, because when so many people came, as was the situation in 2015, you know, it was a, put a strain on, on our systems, of course, uh, our sort of welfare systems and the whole society. And since we've had also a very sort of negative debate and it has affected politics in Sweden where uh, all the problems have been pointed out. And at the same time, Sweden has changed um, drastically from when I grew up. I mean, now I, I think we are around 20% of, of our population, if not more, um, that have roots in, in another country. And of course, this uh, is uh, also a, a blessing and a, a gift to our society. We develop thanks to that. Um, but uh, we also, it, it is also a challenge when you take in so many people at the same time. And especially since we received so many um, children and unaccompanied uh, minors. Um, and the proportion of that made a, a, a sort of an, an impact, a deep impact, impact on, on society. So I think if we had had a, a distribution and a, a sharing of that responsibility uh, when they came in 2015, it wouldn't have been any problem for any country in, in the European Union. But it was uh, it was a fight over over this, and it continued to be, um, I would say, also denotes sort of the the debate that we have on on immigration in in Sweden. Um, and we we want to be, you know, we want to have a human respect the asylum laws and the asylum legislation, and also have a, a human. Um, uh, approach to to dealing with the, those issues. Thanks so much, Margot. We might go to questions from the audience now. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for, for tuning in. I know we've got hundreds of you on the line with us today from right around the country and a few people from overseas as well. Thanks so much for tuning in. Um, the first question that I've got here is from Julianne McKeon. She says, 
uh, how can an ambassador pursuing a feminist foreign policy agenda change or affect the three R's for women in that country as an outsider? Mm -hmm. So perhaps for people who uh, aren't necessarily familiar with um, how diplomacy works in that respect. No, that's a great question. That's absolutely what it's all about. You know, how, how are they supposed to act? Because I think when I, when I announced that we would pursue a feminist foreign policy, many of the ambassadors, I'm sure, sort of their jaws dropped. So what, what is this now? And how are we going to work on this? And this is why it helped to define it, to say, well, you, you have to look at in, in the country where, where you represent Sweden, you should look at when it comes to rights. So what about the legislation in this country? Um, can women open a bank account? Uh, can they inherit the land? Can they uh, take on any job? Can, you know, what about the discriminatory uh, laws, etc.? Can, can girls go to school? And to look at whether we can help when it comes to the gender budgeting or getting the statistics they need and, and all of that. Um, and I think that many ambassadors as well as they told me, they were looking at, so let's see, who do we invite to, to come to the embassy or to different events that we arrange? Are, are we sure that we cover also the, and listen to the voices of, of women and girls uh, properly? Can we do even better? Uh, we introduced through our embassies um, um, an exhibition that was called Swedish Dads. And it turned out that that was a very, very effective way of uh, uh, having an impact on the debate about the role of uh, men in the country. And, and in that country and, and on, for example, introducing parental leave, which was the result in a couple of countries after having had that, uh, seen that, that uh, exhibition. So I think they, they chose according to the, the reality check that they did in, in, in that country, they followed up. And uh, we have also introduced the network of women mediators and negotiators. So. Um, we had 15 members of that network and they have been deployed to uh, situations, uh, uh, you know, peace agreements or, or, um, uh, or, or different process, peace processes in countries from Colombia to Afghanistan. So they are all deployed in, into different situations. So to encourage to make sure that we help, that we share our own experiences and that we work towards gender equality. Um, and I think the enthusiasm that, that came as a result has been absolutely amazing. So it was not difficult because um, if you just look carefully, you will see that there is still so much, unfortunately, so much of of discrimination against women and girls around the world. And we have to do something about that. Mm. The next question is from Jill Rogerson. She says, having women involved in foreign policy clearly changes the outcome of the policy, but does it also change the process by which that policy is achieved? Yeah, I think it will. Uh, if you have sort of enough women um, participating. I think, you know, you, it's not only to have like a token woman that you, you place somewhere, but uh, as was stated already in Beijing and the action plan for women, they say, you know, you need around 30% of women to actually create that critical mass that will change things around. And you will need support from, from other women to to uh, maybe um, turn things around completely or find that, uh, that you work in a different way. But the minute that, that women are, are, are on board, they will also bring their experiences. And I often say, it's not that women are better than men. We, well, of course, we would like to think so, but, <laughs> but <laughs> that's not necessarily true. But we, we have a different uh, experience uh, with us. And, and that is also necessary. It will, make us all richer if we, if we share also women's experience and knowledge and their, their thoughts and ideas about how to work. 
Uh, thank you. The next question that I've got here is from uh, Sarah Davies, and she says she'd like to hear about your experience trying to end arms trade deals with countries that had high gender inequality. And she'd also ch cheekily chucked in a second question here, would like to know your thoughts about the immediate priorities for women's peace and security in the next five years. Mm -hmm. Well, as you know, uh, Sweden uh, also um, produces um, uh, weapons and, um, uh, and military equipment. Um, and of course, um, that is a dilemma uh, for a country who also insists on working for, for peace and development and, and what have you. The way we have dealt with that and with the dilemma is that we have a very strict legislation and control over uh, export of, uh, of a weapon. Um, and um, with, uh, of course, an, um, a role for the Swedish parliament and also with a new, um, um, a new democracy criterion that has been uh, introduced uh, lately. So the process is uh, sort of a separate one with, uh, with the control of, of parliament and also uh, with uh, those kinds of objectives of making sure that uh, it doesn't end up in the wrong, in the wrong hands. Um, and this is uh, an ongoing debate, of course. And um, if, if you ask me, I would have preferred that, that Sweden, not, Sweden did not trade with, uh, in weapons, but uh, it is important for a country that uh, uh, is also uh, a non-allied country and um, to show that we are willing to, to defend ourselves, that we have also a strong, um, a, a strong sort of defense uh, uh, industry. So that is the background of the history and, and how this has uh, developed. And the priorities for women's peace and security in the next five years? Well, well, I think I, I, this is also a very uh, relevant question because I think it just has to be more inclusive that, you know, what is called intersectionality will, will become uh, a more prominent part of, of all of this. To me, this is natural. The minute you, because to me, it's also about democracy. You have to include uh, all, all women and uh, you have to make sure that there is not a, a discrimination. But I think this has to be put much, much clearer also in, in the way we, in our work plans and um, in our structures. Mm. Um, the next two questions are, are kind of similar, so I'm going to put them together. They're from Anna Whip and Isabella Boone. Um, they ask what impact um, the, having a feminist foreign policy would, one asks, would have on Australia's ability to navigate the strategic competition between the United States and China at the moment? Um, and the other one asks on Australia's role in the Pacific Islands. Um, well, I think, you know, we, we can only share sort of our experiences. We can say that this is our history. This is how we have been. This is what we have learned. This is what we believe in. This follows our ideas of, um, of foreign policy and security policy, because I, I truly believe that security policy has to be redefined. We know that security is not hard security. It has to be smart security uh, also for, for the future. And a security policy these days is not only about sort of defense. It is really also about pandemics, climate change and everything that, uh, or environmental catastrophes that will impact, have a deep impact on, on our lives. So you have to redefine security as common security. You have to come back to that uh, concept. It's an old uh, concept. I, I think that, uh, and Australia, of course, will have to design, because I think it's now seven countries that have followed in our footsteps and declared that they have either a development policy or a foreign policy that is a feminist foreign policy, including Mexico, Canada, France, uh, Luxembourg, um, 
uh, Tunisia, um, and I think maybe one or, or two more. And um, you will have to look at how will this be helpful in, in your policy? What is it that we've learned about the role of women in peace processes? Do we believe in that, in those uh, facts and statistics? And what do we do about this? Um, and I think it's obvious because women make up half of, of the population on, on this planet. You cannot exclude women in peace processes because you will not have a long lasting peace unless they are also on board and, and involved and given, uh, listen to and, and be given a, a proper role. So to me, it's, um, I, I, but, but you have to shape it so that it fits, of course, Australia and uh, you choose uh, your path in, into the future. But we are a group of countries that can stick together and, and share our experience. Yeah. Um, the next question is from John Neve. He says, um, how good are fully paid parental leave schemes for better future outcomes for all citizens? And there's quite a few people asking about that uh, Swedish dads exhibition in the chat. Um, just how transformative, I guess, um, was were those policies for Sweden? And how much is that linked to the ability to implement a feminist foreign policy, you know, years, years later? Can I give you a short, a, a very short anecdote? A friend of mine said that he had found his grandfather's diaries and his grandfather wrote today, uh, he had found the dates when they were born, when the children were born. So his grandfather wrote, um, Anna, his wife, gave birth to a son. So he was completely sort of detached from that, from that thing. Then his father wrote, today I got five um, big fish, you know, um, um, pike, I think uh, is the, the name of the, I got five pikes and a son. <laughs> and then he, <laughs> so actually the fish was mentioned first and then that he had a son on the same day. And then his own experience, of course, being there as a father with his, his wife and, and then also using his parental leave. So I think that this is, it, it shows the story of how, how it changes also the way you look at, at children and your own role as a parent and, and the understanding of what it takes to raise a, a child. I think it cannot be, it mustn't be underestimated. And uh, it, it, it's uh, so fantastic to see my sons now with my son with, with his uh, children. And uh, it's just, uh, yeah, I think it transforms a society mm. completely. Very, very important. And the thing with the exhibition was that they were then asked to send in their own photos and their stories about what happened with how they um, relate and how they act and, and are together with their children and moving and fantastic stories. Mm. Um, the next question is from uh, Jill. She says, does Sweden teach gender equality in schools? Yes, yes, absolutely. It's part of, of the curriculum to, to talk about gender equality as well. Um, Margo, you touched on, I guess, um, outcomes for women and being able to find good statistics on uh, budgeting and things like that. Um, Andrew, I wondered if I might just ask you quickly, the chapter after Margo's in the book, and I'll just remind everyone, the Nordic Edge available in all good bookstores in Australia. Um, the chapter after that deals with gender budgeting, um, which was started in Australia, but then kind of fell away. Could you just tell us a little bit about that chapter? Thank you. Um, well, yes, um, Marion Thor is the co-author of the chapter and she was involved, as was Anne Summers, in the pioneering of gender budgeting in the 1980s in Australia, following on from the Whitlam governments uh, and the women, women's electoral lobby efforts. But the strange thing is that Australia invented it and inspired Sweden and other countries to take it up, then Australia stopped it. And Sweden and other Nordic countries kept it going. And Marion is firmly of the view that gender budgeting helps prevent not only gender inequalities, but also mm -hmm. other economic inequalities too. 
and so argues for a return to it. And she does so in conjunction with Lenita Friedenval, a Swedish colleague at the University of Stockholm, uh, who has also advised the Swedish parliament on gender equality. And perhaps the Australian parliament could do with some advice on gender equality too. Mm, indeed. And actually, uh, on that same kind of note, um, the Australia Institute, in, in another anecdote, we did some research looking at the gender impacts and the outcomes of the government's proposed income tax cuts. Um, and we looked at who benefits more, men or women, or if it's equal. And basically, because the income tax cuts package really designed for high income earners and more men earn higher incomes, uh, we found that uh, from stage three tax cuts, men would benefit uh, $2 for every dollar that women received, which uh, the Prime Minister and Treasurer didn't really fancy much. Uh, I think the Prime Minister complained that uh, you don't fill out a pink tax return and a blue tax return. Um, but the reality is, yeah, it was because we don't have that gender budgeting anymore. They're implementing policies that really um, widen a, a an income gap um, and a wealth gap between men and women in Australia. So very interesting. Uh, the next question that we've got here is from Michelle Immerson. She says, Sweden has a proud tradition of generosity to international development assistance, currently over 1% of GDP compared to Australia's 0.2%, which she's correctly described as paltry. The feminist foreign policy's impact can be seen in Sweden's international assistance as well, with a strong focus on sexual and reproductive health and rights. And she asks, how do you think feminist foreign policy will continue to shape Sweden's international assistance in the future? As it has until now, I think it has saved lives. Uh, and the campaign that we had also called Midwives for All um, has really made, made a difference. And it's correct that uh, there has been a focus on, on sexual and reproductive right and, uh, rights and health. And uh, that means the difference between uh, life uh, and death in, in so many countries. Uh, so I, I think that this is um, this will continue to be sort of a, a major part of of development uh, policy, and I think this is also for our own good. <laughs> we have to understand that if we do this, um, we will all, you know, the destiny of others is also our destiny, and we see it uh, clearer and, and clearer if we help. Uh, also poor countries, um, they will be less inclined to, to uh, leave their, their countries and try to, to come here, but instead have a dignified, be able to live a dignified life uh, where, where they are. And uh, so it's, it's uh, something that will help all of us in the end. Mm. Um, I've got a question here and a couple of comments that I've noticed about uh, how good would it be if every leader on the planet was a woman? Uh, you talked a little bit about political representation, but why is that um, important? Well, I, I think we we are, you know, we make up half half of the population, as I've said many times now. So it's fair that that uh, we we could be represented uh, up to to fifty percent, and uh, I think. Uh, we need to share uh, and we, we need to live together also with, with men and the men will play a very, very important role in making sure that this, this is good for both men and women and children. Um, and um, I, I don't think, I, I want to see a, a mix. I think that's natural that we have a, a, a mix of both with women and, and men as leaders. There are too few women who are, who are leaders. I, I admire many of, and it has been said often that in dealing with COVID and the pandemic, women leaders have been more effective. I, um, I don't know if, if we have enough of examples to, to sort of be able to prove that, but I can see that, that women like Jacinda Ardern and Angela Merkel and others, they have found their own way to communicate and their own way to sort of shape the, the policies and interact with their populations. And I think they earn a lot of respect for that. Um, and, and that's what we, we wish for, that, that um, people and women everywhere and women leaders, more women leaders, and that they should be able to do things 
their in their own way, uh, following their personality on their their own ways. Um, I've got a couple of questions in here around uh, whistleblowers from Kimberly and Mike Dore. They're asking how does Sweden regard whistleblowers and what would be the difference in handling such things in Sweden compared to Australia and the USA? Kimberly and Mike, I will point you to uh, the chapter that I co-authored in the book on um, media diversity. Uh, we certainly looked at all the Nordic countries, including Sweden, and they really top the charts for press freedom, uh, the way that they deal with whistleblowers, certainly compared to Australia, which has fallen in the world press freedom rankings um, recently. Uh, and uh, partly I think that's to do with the fact that press freedom is protected in some of the constitutions of those countries and it's not in Australia. Uh, but certainly um, I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Margo, I'll get you to comment on this in a, in a second, but, you know, uh, wouldn't see the raids on things like uh, the ABC and specific journalists like Annika Smethus that we've certainly seen here in Australia in the past and, uh, pretty weak um, defence of Julian Assange um, as well. But is there anything you'd like to add on the topic of whistleblowers, Margot? No, but I, I, there has to be sort of a legal protection of, of, uh, um, of whistleblowers and uh, also the, the kind of legislation that we have, uh, which creates a very open, open society and having uh, access to, uh, to documents and... Uh, and procedures and so on. So that's very important. Mm. And our constitution puts a, a, a good defense for, for whistleblowers as well. Um, the next question is from uh, Harriet Bailey. She says, how do you think diplomatic representatives can institutionalize feminist approaches within the United Nations systems and organizations, noting that very few international organizations are headed by women? Well, I, I, you know, you have to be um, consistent and coherent. If, if we announce that we pursue a feminist foreign policy, we, we have to make sure that we, our ambassadors, are also women, that we appoint women, and, and we, we change that and improve that um, during my years uh, as well. So you have to make sure that, that um, you, you make an, uh, and turn into an example of, of all of this. And you have to be um, very stubborn in all of these organizations. You have to look at sort of uh, what candidates to support to make sure that you change the representation. You have to make sure that you also invite and interact with civil society organizations because they have a particular role to play. And, this was also part of my agenda that I wanted to invite um, the civil society organizations to come also to, to the foreign ministry to um, uh, give us sort of their insights and their ideas about how to, to work on, on certain uh, policy areas. So uh, I think this is an ongoing uh, work and you just have to make sure that you insist on, on this being you, you change the attitude and you change the understanding of certain things. I, I think we should mention also one more thing. And I, I think we have, I think I mentioned it in, in my chapter, but we also looked at um, uh, Wikipedia uh, and we noted that 90% of the editors were men. <laughs> and we, we um, of course, um, we became sort of the, the, the place where they could come, where we invited women and those who could write more pieces uh, about women uh, to, to put on, on uh, Wikipedia. And uh, this result had a very good result with, with all of this. And uh, I think that's another example of, of what you can, can do to, to change sort of the, the outcome and the, and the results. And the, um, the next question I've got is from uh, Rochelle Streich, Streak. Sorry if I've mispronounced your name there, Rochelle. She says, what recommendations can you suggest for Australians in interested in helping to progress a treaty with First Nations Australians? Uh, can I give any advice? I don't know <laughs> if I'm the right person to give uh, any advice. I That's think right. that... The, the minute you you um, 
you find your your voice the minute you find others to share your engagement engagement with then you will also find a way to um, to work on it if you want to start a new organization or if you want to enter into existing uh, organizations but uh, I guess there is a lot of work to to do so um, I, I I really I'm not the, the best person to, to <laughs> give you advice on what to do in, in Australia at the moment. Could I just mention there Ebony and Margot um, it's not so widely known that Finland has um, a constitution which protects the languages of its indigenous Sami people and indeed not only protects the languages but in enshrines the right that they be able to go to school and maintain their own languages. And that is something, of course, we haven't done in Australia. And the Sami people, the indigenous peoples of the Nordic region have much less health disparities um, compared to the rest of the population than indigenous Australians do. And there's quite a bit to be uh, learned from that, that comparison. Mm. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, just worth noting that people uh, can support the Uluru Statement from the Heart. And there's a big push on this year to really make sure that the voice to parliament in particular uh, stays on the national agenda and gets progressed. Um, before we wrap up, I've got one last question here from Yolanda Vega, and you've already kind of touched, I think, uh, Margot, on a couple of these things, but I thought it might be good to kind of end on what positive outcomes have been measured from the Swedish foreign policy, feminist foreign policy and what have been the results? Give us some of the greatest hits. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I would say, first of all, that we placed it firmly on the UN Security Council's agenda. I think it will stay there and we will see that, that it is needed more and more. Uh, I think that we've done it in changing the lives of women and girls everywhere through our embassy's work, through the development policy, through, through trade policy and everything that, that our fantastic diplomatic people in the diplomatic corps are, are doing uh, as well, introducing policies that ensures the right, the representation and that resources go to, to all these uh, women and girls. I think that the network of, uh, and networks I would say, because now they exist in many parts of, of the world, uh, of women mediators and negotiators will also change the way we look at uh, peace processes. So I think we'll see that more women means uh, more peace. And I think that we have put in place also a structure in the, the foreign ministry that will let this live on. And I hope we have inspired uh, others and uh, as well. And I can see that there are organizations now um, set up uh, that will argue for, for a feminist foreign policy. So I, I hope that um, by being a bit controversial, choosing a controversial term like this, we, we have also uh, maybe a little bit bent the, the arc of, of history in, in the right direction. But it is also the practical outcomes in, in looking at rights, representation and resources that, that I care about. Yeah, well, we'll have to wrap it up there, but Thank you so much for your time this evening, Margot, and to you, Andrew, as well. Uh, Margot's written an absolutely cracking chapter, so please check out the book. You should be able to find it in all your local bookstores. The Nordic Edge Policy Possibilities for Australia, uh, co-editor Professor Andrew Scott, as well as our research director, Rod Campbell, who couldn't join us tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for your wonderful questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them. And uh, just a reminder, don't forget to subscribe to australiainstitute.tv. Uh, you'll find all the recordings from our previous webinars and uh, the recording from tonight's one will be up there soon as well. And thanks very much, everyone. Stay safe out there and we'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you for you. having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.